Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This time, our guest is composer Daniel Nags, who is visiting assistant professor of composition and music theory at the College of Worcester in Ohio. Daniel, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. How are things in uh, Ohio? Chilly, but good. You have worked with the Houston Chamber Choir. Um, they have performed uh, a couple of your pieces. Can you tell us about those pieces? I think the first one that they did was maybe uh, Ave Maria number 12, Portocelli. Yes, Portocelli um, was commissioned for them. Uh, part of my Ave Maria project, which is a 50 year Ave Maria project. I'm writing a new Ave Maria every single year. So they got number 12. And um, that was a beautifully premiered. Uh, I will never forget the premiere of that. Actually, they just sang the living daylights out of it. And it was so beautiful. So the second piece to everything a season, which I believe is based on the passage from the book of Ecclesiastes. Right. So that piece is part of a set of three songs called uh, Of Time and Passing. And that's the second, that's the kind of the centerpiece um, of that set. And yeah, that, that's a piece that maybe is a bit unusual for me in that it uses a sort of a classical style, if I can say that, with a more pop music style. Um, you know, for, for different reasons, but uh, yeah, that was also beautifully, beautifully sung by the choir. Did you actually participate in rehearsing with the choir? I'm afraid that I did not make it to a rehearsal for that piece because I was up here teaching and I had to fly down, I believe the night before um, and it was, everything was pretty, pretty quick. I did get a quick pre-concert um, hearing of the rehearsal and they were like feedback, you know, they always want feedback from the composer. It's like, you sound too good. There's nothing for me to say. I, I just, you're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so I will shut up. You don't need anything from me. <laughs> like it was really, really uh, beautiful to hear them. As a composer, it must be nerve wracking to be sitting in an audience listening to your work performed. And I imagine that with the chamber choir, there was that trepidation on your part, but you had nothing to fear. Yeah, I, I would say that I'm always spoiled by groups like them where um, I can just enjoy the performance. There are other times when, you know, I'm not sure they're gonna sing the rhythms correctly or if they had enough time to prepare, but I never, I've never worried about that with the Houston Chamber Choir. And uh, they did one of my pieces called Trois Chansons. I think that was the first that they did. Um, and- Three songs. Yeah, three songs in French. They did the third, they did the third song um, and just sang it so incredibly beautiful. It was so beautiful, the performance of that. And um, they also did uh, my Ave Maria number 13 on one of their Christmas concerts. So um, again, every single time, every time they do something of mine, I really feel honored, but I just love hearing them sing, period. Whosoever music they're doing, they seem to really get it and really dedicate themselves to bringing it to life in the best way possible, so. How did you and the chamber choir cross paths? Uh, that's a great question. Probably back in about 2012, when I started uh, studying at Rice University for my doctorate in composition, um, I found out about the choir. I saw my first performance uh, of them and I was sort of like a, you could call like a roadie or a fan club type. Uh, I just was, I was so happy that there was a group like this in Houston mm -hmm. uh, of such a high quality of singing. I, I couldn't believe the soprano section and was really questioning myself, like, are, you know, is this, is, how is this possible? Basically, it was such a beautiful sound. I was, uh, I was amazed. And so I think we started getting more in touch because I put on a project 
uh, my second year of the doctorate. It was my first doctoral recital, and I wanted to hire a choir pretty much piecemeal to perform five new pieces of my uh, choral pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I contacted Bob and uh, asked him, hey, are there any singers maybe that I could ask? And there probably about 15 of them um, formed the 15 of the 20 singers that I hired in order to do this uh, performance and recording. And so we actually came out with a CD. And again, it was not the Houston Cham Chamber Choir, but it was a really big portion of that group. Uh, and so I got to meet a lot of them through that. And um, they, they sang, again, so well. It was, to me, otherworldly the first, first time I heard that, that group sing together even, so. So from a composer's perspective, when you heard the choir, what was it in particular that struck you about the choir? Okay, yeah. Sometimes it's so difficult to put it into words because um, the sounds that you hear, again, um, I, I can use sort of technical language to say like, you know, they were blending so well that they sounded like one voice. It was a bunch of voices, probably 23, 24 voices or something, but they sounded like one voice and their attention to detail and every single line. I mean, everything was just so coherent, so logical. And I felt transported out of myself. Um, and, and this was not just the first time I heard them. This would be often, I was rediscovering this beauty. And every time I saw them in a performance or in a concert. So, um, that is, and then the first rehearsal, like I said, of, of the pieces of mine that they were doing for my recital, they just started, I said, everyone practice your parts. Here are some click tracks or whatever, but I want you to be ready. Oh my gosh, they were almost like ready to perform it before they'd ever sung together. It was so, so weird and so musical. So it was, it's, it's really hard to describe, but um, I just remember being blown away by that experience. I think they were overdue to win the Grammy. I knew that it had to be coming, but uh, yeah, I, I felt like it was about time for them to, to win that. Because they actually commissioned the uh, the Ave Maria number 12 was a commission, wasn't it? Yes. Talk about that project, the Ave Maria project. So a wonderful conception. What is What is the force behind it? That's a great question. Like I get really excited about organizing my work into like bigger entities. So I, I have a few other projects that are kind of ongoing. And anytime I think about something, I'm like, whoa, let's make this a project. I, I get really excited about that. And I'm actually not 100% sure why, but I love, uh, it, it, I think part of it is reflected really well on the Ave Maria project. So I mm -hmm. had been composing since I was a child and um, not usually transcribing things in, in a recognizable way, but maybe with my own kind of symbols and so forth. But by the time uh, I started getting serious about really wanting to compose Ave Maria number one, it wasn't called that at the time, it was just called Ave Maria, okay? That was the right. first, that was the first officially notated composition that I completed. And so I, it was for cello, probably mezzo soprano. I think a soprano sang it, but uh, cello, piano, and mezzo soprano. I finished How it. How old were you? Uh, probably twenty-one. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Or so. So this was a, a bit later, um, because I started off as a, a voice major. But this was later in in the in the uh, undergrad. So I ended up notating this, and then I felt like, man. I'm a little bummed. There's some really good Ave Marias out there, like way better than this. And I feel like I blew my chance to like say something special, you know, with an Ave Maria. So I actually gave it a try the next year. I did another one, just soprano and piano. And then uh, I was like, okay, yeah, a lot of people seem to, you know, like it or whatever. But then I wanted to try another one. And by the third one, this was, I was traveling in Quebec. Uh, in Montreal, actually, and uh, I was inspired by the Basilica of Notre Dame and actually the mm. Basilique Cathedrale Marie Grandimon, uh, 
Mary Queen of the World Basilica Cathedral, I think. So I was, I wrote a French Ave Maria and then I thought, you know what? I'm not ready to stop doing this yet. And I think I want to uh, see what will happen if I do a new one every year. And I came up with the idea of 50 in order to make it fit nicely. And plus there's a, a good stretch of time, like 50 chances, I should be able to get something, maybe one of them get close to something that satisfies me uh, within 50, you know, 50 shots at it. Um, so, and then that also fits into the idea of like 50 Ave Marias is like a rosary, right? Five decades. Mm -hmm. And we are through, we're more than halfway through the second decade right now of that, which is really hard for me to believe, but we just uh, had number 16 premiered last week or the week before that. So, and, and I guess you distinguish uh, each one by using a different, from the litany of the Blessed Virgin, there are all these epithets that yeah. have been, over time, have been attached to the Virgin. Uh, number 12, which you wrote for the chamber choir, is Porta Celi, the, uh, the gate of heaven. Right. What does that mean to you, and where, where did you pull that from? Well, I can't take credit for it, obviously. <laughs> Porta Celi means gate of heaven, and in this particular, uh, this particular choice of a title, I was playing around with how to make something original. However, that uh, what it what is original, who knows? But I was actually playing around with some uh, texts in English by uh, Saint John Henry Newman, um, and ended up finding this really beautiful passage that I wanted to juxtapose against the Ave Maria, at least the, the, the opening Ave Maria in Latin, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it sort of uh, explains this sort of gate of heaven idea that um, basically the one, Christ, the one who came from heaven, uh, comes through this gate. You could have just kind of plopped down on earth but it was, uh, there's a really powerful moment in the text that says that uh, a daughter of man became the mother of God. And so like, again, I can spend a lot of time just with mind blowage of that, uh, that concept itself. Right. And so right. I really tried to um, not get in the way of it by the music, but really kind of celebrate it and um, portray that as, as much as possible. And kind of the, the, the voices in the Houston Chamber Choir, again, the purity of sound, I couldn't have hoped for a better realization of that, that composition than, than what they gave. It was so moving to me to hear that. So. In terms of your composing, um, a lot of what you write, not exclusively, but you write um, a great deal of choral music. Is it all sacred? or liturgical? No, very little of it is actually liturgical. All right. And um, a lot of it is sacred. Um, a lot of the commissions that I've received have been for sacred music. So mm -hmm. for example, commission from Wells Cathedral um, in, in England. In They're England. not going to be, yeah, they won't be looking for like a kind of cutting edge, uh, super secular piece for one of the like candlelight Christmas service. I mean, like it's gonna be definitely um, appropriate for the occasion, right? But okay. I have a number of works that are are secular as well. And so uh, the Tosh Nosson is one of them. And of time and passing is sort of a borderline. It, it sort of crosses the, it blurs the lines a little bit. The first is a purely secular poem. And then we have um, two, two pieces that are scriptural, but the, it, it does sort of, Blur the lines and not very liturgical in any sense of the imagination. But yeah. to every season that we mentioned is one of the the three works in um, of time and passing. Mm -hmm. If I'm if I'm remembering that correctly, and that was a commission from uh, Vaches Eight, the the British ensemble. Mm -hmm. You've written a lot for um, ensembles outside of the US. Because obviously Britain, England has a very strong 
uh, choral tradition um, because of the, you know, the great cathedrals, um, but also, you know, uh, I mean, you've got King's College in Cambridge and uh, Trinity College, and I know you've worked with the uh, the choir at Trinity College as well. Um, obviously, it's a fruitful ground for you. Mm. Yeah, it's it's like paradise for for uh, vocal composers in particular, who, uh, composers who like vocal music. And I kind of I started off as a voice major and wanted to be an opera singer. And it was sort of a, a heartbreaking but yet happy discovery that uh, I was not going to make it as an opera singer. The voice just wasn't developing the way that uh, it would need to. And mm -hmm. it actually made room for me to compose. And I often, like I said, live vicariously through my compositions. So things that I would love to perform or I would love to sing, I write them down and someone else does it. And I feel like I'm living it through their, their gift uh, and their abilities. In, in a sense, um, I just, I absolutely love, I love the choral tradition in the UK. It's something that I think um, it should, it's a great pride to the country, but it's, it's so beautiful. And it's when you experience it in person, again, you can think about the overtones that you're hearing or some of these spaces. And again, it's for me, if I can even use language like this, it's like a little piece of heaven on earth. It, it, it's a way to forget some of the chaos that we're sometimes living in and that we find ourselves in. And there's such joy and such depth of beauty. And I cannot Still, I mean, I've been doing this for at least 16 years officially composing, right? And I cannot get enough of it. I can't. I love it. It's uh, there's something mystical about it, isn't there? There really is. It's interesting. You you talk about the uh, Porta Celli and Mary as the uh, the gate of heaven. Mm -hmm. It's where the human touches the divine, mm -hmm. and you know that those great choral works sung in those phenomenal spaces there is something completely mystical about it i agree i i would love for everyone to be able to experience it in person as well it's um it's truly amazing now you mentioned that as an undergraduate you were a voice major um but then for your masters and for your doctorate you moved into composition. That's right. And that was because you didn't think you could make it as a as a singer. I think I, I don't I mean knew. to make it sound like composing is sort of second best, but no, but, but I think I knew that I couldn't make it as a singer. Okay. I, I gave it I gave it everything. I actually mm -hmm. gave it I, I believe I gave it 150%. And I think that my professors would tell you the same. I was probably hopeless all along, but boy, did I give it 150%. Get my hands on every book on singing, every learn about every opera singer there ever was, you know, and to talk to everybody and find, you know, all kinds of people to ask advice. But the, the truth of it is when I went into my undergrad, I actually knew that I needed to study music, music in Spanish, okay? But I knew I needed to study music. And so it was gonna be either composition, uh, which I didn't have a lot of training, or piano, which I was not very good. And third, uh, it could be voice. And my voice teacher and I, in my high school years, we decided together that the best way for me to try to get my foot in the door to a music program would be through voice. The other two, I probably wouldn't have much of a chance um, getting in. So I sort of came in University of Michigan through the back door, so to speak. Um, and it was very... I already loved singing. I already loved languages. And I chose a very uh, strange set of songs to audition with, one of them being a Schoenberg piece. I just wanted to show them, like, listen, I may not be very good, but I've got language and I've got, uh, you know, the ability to sing random chromatic pitches on tune. So I think uh, they were very impressed by that aspect, if nothing else. Some of them were like, yeah, the, the voice is pretty good, but. Uh, I did get some feedback that like this piece is probably a little too mature for a 17 year old. Doesn't matter. I, I loved it and I was ready to just go in and, and, and give it everything. So, but yeah, I, I think that is how um, after, you know, 
I, and I had some solos and I had some nice moments and things like that, but really the, the idea that I didn't feel like my voice even had the stamina to, to do what an opera singer would need to do, right? So it opened the door for, I mean, it, it, it served its purpose. It got my foot in the door. I fell more deeply in love with that and languages and diction. Um, and so that's, that's where I think after that, I knew that the masters and the doctorate would have to be treated more like making up for lost time, right? Uh, so tenor, baritone or bass, which are you? I was a tenor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would prefer to uh, be more like a baritone, can't play it safer now. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I did go and tried to change to bass and they said, no, tenor. No. You mentioned that you were, I think, a double major, music and uh, vocal performance and Spanish. Mm -hmm. And you speak, you're a polyglot. You speak, I think, six different languages. More or less and maybe less, <laughs> okay? But <laughs> I studied Spanish officially, majored in mm -hmm. it. And part of the major, I also was able to study Brazilian Portuguese for Spanish speakers, which was an accelerated track that yeah. specializes in the similarities between the languages so that it's mm -hmm. a little bit more uh, efficient way of learning. But I also was required to take French, Italian, and German as part of the voice major. And I was like, great. I. <laughs> I'd want to take them anyway, so yeah. But then uh, I ended up picking up Polish um, very lightly. Again, um, not not very good, but I still try to use it. I've taken about five trips to Poland so far and um, have some contacts there, some performances, and even just actually got an email today from the Polish Chamber Choir saying, hey, Daniel, we are we have a concert today, live stream. And it was one hour before this interview. So I actually watched 45 minutes of it before this. Beautiful, right? Um, but I try to uh, keep up with Polish as well, just because I also love that country and the beautiful music making and the beautiful artistry and like castles and just so much history. And it's just like, I love that. And I even like the food, right? So it's a great, it's a, it's a great combination for me of my love of history, languages, uh, great people, culture, all of that. Have you set any Polish texts? I have. Uh, actually, Ave Maria number four, I want to say, is as Trovas Mario. So that's the Ave Maria in Polish. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, it has yet to be premiered. The premiere was canceled, <laughs> but I was supposed to fly to um, Poland this month to conduct the, the world premiere of my, uh, a new cantata called uh, Dva Zdroje, Two Streams. And uh, that is a, about a 45 minute work. And since it didn't get premiered, I'm probably going to expand it a little bit. I figured, you know, if I, if I have to wait all this time, let's make something more out of it. So it's string orchestra <laughs> and choir with some soloists and, um, I, I, it was a very moving piece to work on for me and it's dedicated to the memory of my father. So um, I'm really hoping that we can maybe do this on the, the festival next year that it doesn't get, uh, maybe next October, it doesn't get canceled, it would be great. You mentioned your father. Mm -hmm. um, did you grow up in a musical household? Yes and no. And I would say yes. <laughs> Yes, because uh, my dad played guitar. He would sing to us kids uh, before putting us to bed. And even if it were Sesame Street songs or just about anything, um, he had records, he loved music. And um, I was trying to think, man, they're probably gonna ask me about what I grew up with musically and so forth. But I didn't really get anything classical from my parents, um, mm -hmm. except one thing that my my father took me to a performance of, I must've been eight years old, nine years old, but it was a performance of Handel's Messiah at the uh, Peristyle in Toledo. I probably fell asleep after 30 minutes, but like what I did experience, I was super blown away by. Uh, mm -hmm. And especially the harpsichord, the timbre of the harpsichord. Anytime I heard a harpsichord, I had a little Casio keyboard that could make that sound at home. Like, oh my gosh, it's Handel's Messiah right in my keyboard. <laughs> it seemed so, um, so I was just fascinated by that timbre altogether. But other than that, um, it, 
we would all sing, you know, songs together. We had these Disney sing-along, VHS, uh, all kinds of, you know, my siblings and I would sing. And But uh, as far as classical music, I had to be a sleuth and I had to, uh, you know, kind of look for crumbs of anything that I could find. And I, I found little snippets of classical music in this CD-ROM encyclopedia called Encarta. And I heard mm. like a 30 second clip of a Scarlatti piece, like a 30 second clip of a Beethoven, probably his fifth piano concerto. And then like a 30 second clip of a Bach fugue. Or something. And I was so hooked, just those 30 seconds, like, oh my gosh, I tried to figure out what was going on. I wanted to reproduce it uh, on the keyboard and all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And I just fell in love with this. It sparked a curiosity that actually I can't get rid of. It's, it's still there so not that's beyond those 30 seconds but <laughs> how old were you when you started to learn the piano i think five or six. Oh, my really uncle, it was early mm -hmm. yeah my uncle gave me a toy piano that probably had about an octave and a half and already on that i just had such a desire to like make my own songs and my parents finally uh, you know got a keyboard that I could do more with, but then they put me in piano lessons for about a year. And I unfortunately decided that I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. I, I hated it. So <laughs> I wanted to play by ear. I did not want to play nursery rhymes at the piano. And so we fought, I won. And unfortunately I did not continue studying piano until college and masters and doctorate. But at what point did you know that you wanted to pursue music? Um, I, I would almost change the question and say, was there ever a time that I didn't uh, know? And I, I can't, okay. can't remember. Okay. I think um, as early as I knew that there was such a thing as pursuing anything, I knew that it had to be music. And um, I got carried away. I would have notebooks where I was like, all right, I told you I love projects. I'd be like 10 years old deciding that I'm going to write a musical about this or that. And um, thankfully no one's ever going to see those things, but like I was so <laughs> sure that I had to do this. I got really fired up about it and I would um, make all the plot and um, start putting together what keys the song is going to be in and all, do all of this stuff. So I always kind of knew that I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't help myself, right? I had these tendencies towards like uh, creating music, no matter what, no matter if anyone's going to listen, my grandma loved it, all right? But I knew that maybe no one else would ever listen. And so, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but it didn't stop me, so. That's the mark of a, a true musician, isn't it? Or a true composer is you, you write it even, even though you believe nobody will ever hear it. That could, it could be. And I mean, I would, I would be careful about calling myself a true musician by any uh, standards, but uh, I, I definitely, something resonates with me that like uh, anytime someone hears my music, I feel honored. Like I, I have been saying this for a long time that I'd never feel entitled to being heard or my music being out there at all. So every single time, uh, I have this like great amount of gratitude because I used to dream about, oh my gosh, what if one day a choir could sing my, I don't care how good they are. What if a choir could do my music, you know? And this was like right. not that long ago, mm -hmm. really not that long ago that I was, and, and then um, more things started to happen. And now I feel so grateful. Like so many of my dreams have already come true, right? So I do write um, knowing that I may never get another commission the rest of my life. I may never have a performance the rest of my life, but, uh, but I'm still grateful for everything that has happened. And then there's still something inside that forces me. Like I can't not do it. I have to, I have to do it basically. You've lived in other countries. I think uh, Mexico and Nicaragua and, and France. What impact has living abroad had on you as a person and as a composer? Now, that's a fantastic question. It's probably a difficult one to answer, but I think that some of the experiences that we have, especially when we 
go to different cultures. There's so much that's difficult to um, summarize in words, right? And I think that there, there are things working on the subliminal level as well. But mm -hmm. in terms of living in, in pretty different places too, right? Uh, a very, very urban area in uh, Monterrey, Mexico versus uh, much more rural settings in Nicaragua. And then uh, being in a pretty pretty nice city in France, Tour, um, and several visits to Paris and so forth. But every single one of those, I think, um, I'd always had this desire, again, like as long as I can remember, to get out there and experience what other cultures have to offer. But not just that, to meet the people that speak these languages that I love or meet the people that are behind some of these cultural, like some of the music that I love, some of, all of these things. And so um, I can almost summarize every single one of the countries more in like snapshots that I associate with them. Some memories, some of them are audio memories, some of them are visual memories and so forth. But, uh, and then the food, obviously like all of these experiences, but I think that in terms of how it's maybe had an effect on my music is uh, I've been exposed to a lot of uh, thought and a lot of um, art, I would say, from these cultures mm -hmm. that I felt like I can really take in, you know, and um, really take to heart and appreciate. And sometimes I don't know how it's going to end up through the processor and uh, go through and bleed into my music in some way, but I really do believe I really do believe that it, it does. You've obviously set some French texts because of the the, the Trois Chansons. What about Spanish? Have you uh, have you set any Spanish texts? I have, you know, and surprisingly little, um, surprisingly little considering what my major was and how much time I have spent in Spanish speaking countries. But I, I have done a, a set of art songs with the poetry of Pablo Neruda. And um, mm -hmm. these are, I call them Twilight songs, but there are three songs in Spanish. And I've also, actually it's my Ave Maria number 11 is a bilingual Ave Maria, English mm -hmm. and Spanish. And it's, uh, it's got a more of a Mexican bent in terms of where the text comes from about 500 years ago in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so th those are the only two that come to mind. I know that I've done some instrumental music that's been heavily influenced by Mexico. Um, in particular, a brass quintet that I did that's called Snapshots from Mexico, which is meant to capture a lot of the experiences that I had when I was over there. Uh, some of them very funny experiences and some of them uh, experiences that really, um, I was struck by awe. Um, others were impressions of the city and everybody feels it's their duty to honk tons and tons <laughs> whether it's going to make a difference or not in the traffic oh man so like a lot of these things and brass can be good for um capturing that i guess but um yeah uh, mexico definitely has had uh, and and it comes back i mean it, it comes back into a lot of the music and um thinking that i do so we've talked about your choral music what about your uh instrumental music yeah. How would you uh, how would you sum sum up what you've written uh, for ensembles that do not include voices? Yeah, uh, that is a great question. I'd say um, you know I try to allow all of my pieces to be sort of independent of each other as much as I can, even though I know there's always going to be my isms or whatever whatever those would be can probably leak into the music, but. Some things that um, I, I love orchestration, first of all. So I love the ability to play with colors. I love the ability to create ambiance and uh, different, uh, you know, different moods and things like that, just by changing the colors of, of instrument combinations and things like that. But I, I tend to, uh, I did a lot of chamber music, I would say when I was in my master's and my doctorate because we had forces available to to uh, perform those much more easily than if I were doing orchestral music. But uh, I really love writing orchestral music and I've been doing a, quite a bit more of it lately. So, um, and now I'm starting to bridge over into some film music, which is 
for me, uh, very exciting, but it's mostly heavily orchestral music as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's fun to, uh, to also be able to let loose in the, in, in that. So I can sometimes fuse more like even like rock or pop or more electronic stuff into some mm -hmm. of the scores. And uh, other times it's like straight up um, acoustic orchestra, orchestral music, contrapuntal and all of this stuff, the things that I love to do. So it's quite a lot of fun. So are you a, a big fan of John Williams, for example? You know, I hate to say it, but yes, I am. No, there's absolutely nothing <laughs> wrong with that whatsoever. No, my, my students love his music as well. And mm -hmm. um, I love to bring out um, the question to my students. Okay, wait, so what's good about this? All right, mm -hmm. what's exciting about this? Or what's effective about this? And I've been known to say, hey, let's listen to another piece real quick. And I put a holst or you know, like put a right of spring where, where you can, like, hey, wait a minute. I, I think that they may be consulted on this music. I like to do that, poke a little bit of fun, but it's actually good music. It's well-written, it's super effective. And um, I think they're good lessons for us, even in our orchestrating. Like I just used it the other day in my orchestration class, a few examples for my students. So I do like the music of John Williams. So who are your compositional heroes? Oh man, there's just so many, you know, and I keep finding out who more of, you know, who they are. Uh, but some of them are vocal um, music composers from the Renaissance. I would say that Talos and Bird are real heroes to me, musically, just independence of mind and these uh, innovative tendencies that they had in their music, um, Palestrina, Franco Flemish, I really like a lot of that. And I love Josquin. Um, so lots of them. And then mm -hmm. um, I've had lots of moments with Bartok and Stravinsky and now some modern composers that I have really enjoyed their music. Chen Yi is at UMKC. Uh, she's a fantastic composer and person. And I've also really enjoyed a lot of the Finnish composers. So Magnus mm -hmm. Lindbergh, uh, Kaya Sariaho. Um, Rautavara. One of my favorites, yeah. yeah. Uh, I love his music, yeah. Do you remember the first album that you bought? I guess you were you were a CD child. I was, I was, a, yeah. I was vinyl, but uh, do you remember the first piece, the first CD that you actually went out and bought for yourself? With my own money, yeah, I think I do. This is uh, gonna date me a little bit, but uh, at Kmart, there was a Kmart. stack of CDs. Uh, they probably $4 each, $5 each, but they were, I think, branded classics for meditation, you know, to be very uh -huh. specific. So obviously, I didn't know enough to look for specific composers yet, um, but I, I purchased that CD and I loved it. I don't think I have it anymore, but it had uh, it introduced me to a whole bunch of different composers. It had Mendelssohn on it, had Mozart. It actually had uh, some Rachmaninoff on it, one one of the movements from one of his piano concertos, and so I was actually really really uh, loving it. All of these different composers, like let's Grieg, uh, Tchaikovsky. Tons of tons of composers. So I really had a lot of fun with that. You mentioned the revelation to you that was hearing uh, Handel's Messiah mm. and how struck you were by the sound of the harpsichord. Have you written anything for harpsichord? No, I, I am sad to say that I, I haven't yet, but actually I was speculating with um, one of the conductors in the UK about, you know, there may be a Nags Messiah someday. Not that anyone needs it, right? But that, <laughs> I think that it would be such a great, uh, wonderful, again, project to work on, um, to do kind of just in my own voice or in my own way. I would, I would absolutely love to do that. And if I did that, I would have to use harpsichord. And so maybe we could say, listen, let's uh, substitute one of the, I, I, we can mix and match with, handle it would be too long to do like side by side okay it, it just already it's a lot of music for people to sit through but um i do like that that idea of um 
including harpsichord in something, right? But what I haven't um, used harpsichord for, I've actually been able to approximate maybe some of those timbres or mm -hmm. some of those frequencies by percussion sections. So some of the attacks that more, you know, kind of percussive attack that the harpsichord has, I've, I've been able to sneak that into my, um, my compositions, either through Celesta, uh, Glockenspiel, um, xylophone maybe is a bit of a stretch, but you know, some of these things where uh, uh, crotales, some of these more crisp sound things that definitely, mm -hmm. usually I can't say, hey, does your orchestra have a, a harpsichord that we could uh, work with? Usually that's not on the table, <laughs> so. <laughs> and you mentioned, you know, thinking about possibly one day, you know, writing the, the nags and the sire. What other compositional goals do you have? Okay, yeah, wow. So I, I actually, one of my professors said this uh, several years ago that that he sees a uh, a future for me in oratorio, like extended mm -hmm. choral works with orchestra, like choral orchestral. He thinks that's uh, that would be something good. Now, whether there's a market for that, whether there are resources for that, you know, whether there's demand for that is another thing, but it actually could be just something that if I could find time, that I would love to do things like that. But um, I'm seeing probably more um, more choral, choral pieces and some of them fitting into, you know, the Ave Maria project. Hopefully nothing happens to me and I can finish through the all 50 years of that. But I have another choral project, which is called After Motets, which mm. Pieces Talk there. about that because that's you mentioned some of the Renaissance composers mm -hmm. that uh, that you love. Yeah, and the after motets come out of that, don't they? They do, they do, and uh, it was actually not my idea first. This was Simon Carrington's idea first. He really liked uh, the idea of a modern take or spin or somehow uh, responding or reacting to these pieces from. Maybe He's a British conductor. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. A uh, former member of the King Singers, right. and uh, so he he commissioned the first four of them, and now I have another um, that I'll be writing uh, pretty soon. But the, I'm looking um, to expand this collection of they're pretty short and concise, but mm -hmm. they are often um, contrapuntal. They're often fusing sort of my voice with I started exploring this in the doctorate actually with one of my classes I shouldn't probably advertise this but instead of writing a paper which I did not want to do I was <laughs> allowed to uh, it was in renaissance music history I was allowed to compose not one but two motets and they had to also be sort of a fusion of like my own voice and some aspect of um, motets so and I did two of them and uh, that kind of got me started wanting to do more of this and fusing more. And so, and I, I probably sounds like I skipped over kind of Baroque and classical, but I, I should mention two more heroes of mine and definitely Bach, uh, definitely mm -hmm. Bach, definitely Mozart. Um, and I mean, I could, we could do full on uh, interviews on just those individuals, you know, but um, yeah, so. I, I'm excited. I don't really know what to expect from here, but um, teaching is a big part of what I do. So I really love um, seeing what my students are working on and helping to encourage them and uh, help them build their own career as well and their own unique 21st century path, you know, because there's no, there's no mold anymore. I don't know that there ever really was, but there's no real mold. So um, they get me thinking about what I'm doing and they get me thinking also about uh, what I do in my music, you know, so. Um, what influence do they have on what you listen to? Do you find that they, they introduce you to, to new music? My students do actually. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a couple in particular, there are about three in particular who really, um, hey, Dr. Nags, have you heard this? So I actually assign them about four pieces every single week that they have to write to, to me about. Um, they all do the same ones. So they're all gonna listen mostly with score. A lot of it is just contemporary music and they have to write a paragraph or two. Um, some are very zealous and they write like an essay on every single piece. 
which is really fun for me to read actually, but then they have to choose their own adventure for one of the pieces and they come back with one or two. And I'm like, man, I've never heard of this person or wow, where did you find this? And very mm-hmm. interesting just today, listen to uh, some new music that one of my students recommended uh, because I was super curious about it. And so yes, they are, they are keeping me sharp. They're keeping me abreast of uh, what I maybe have missed of what might be going on right now. And that's very exciting to me. So. If you're on a plane and you start strike up a conversation with your the person sitting next to you and they ask you, what do you do? And you say, I'm, I'm a composer. And they say, what do you compose? How would you answer that? How do you see yourself as a composer? Can you distill it down to an idea? I think I can. I first have to congratulate the person for not saying, oh, that means you wave a stick. This is a very, uh, (laughs) this is already a great conversation. (laughs) But uh, I would say um, I write mostly acoustic music. And um, I love writing for human voices, right? But I also love writing for all of the instruments in the orchestra. And so it's hard to pinpoint it and narrow it down, but I, I would almost use the word classical in the sense that um, I love the full range, the full range of acoustic instruments and singing and um, and I love the full range of history, right? In terms of what, what music's available. Well, look, Daniel, it's been great to talk to you. Uh, fascinating to hear about your music and how you think about music. And uh, I hope that we get to, uh, to have the Houston Chamber Choir interact with you again in some way, shape or form in the not too distant future. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Sinjin. I really appreciate it. And thanks for having me today. Thank you. And thank you to everybody that supports the Houston Chamber Choir as a patron, as a subscriber, or as an audience member. We do appreciate you. Thank you very much. I'm Sinjin Flynn. Join us again next time. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue to create new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org/give.